Welcome back to Life Now from Fox. I'm Gina Francine. Continuing that conversation of this breaking news as we're talking about that ceasefire ending, fighting has continued as far as the Israel Hamas war is concerned. Uh, my good friend Raina Rose Exelbeard continuing to join us at this hour. She's the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors and the CEO of the Rose Grows. Raina, thank you for staying on. Really briefly, I know um, the first part we were talking about the latest of the ceasefire and the Israel Hamas war. Right now, I want to get into more of the hostage situation. Before the break, you made um, a statement, and if people are just now tuning in, I'd love for you to expound upon that. And just to make sure I, I'm understanding you, you were saying that Palestinian prisoners held by Israel, you know, we were seeing Ophir prison on the screen um, plenty of times last week. You were saying those Palestinian families were getting paid. I, ju I just want you to break that down for us. Yes, the Palestinian Authority pays out terrorists and their families, and the more heinous crime you commit, the more money your family is going to receive. So for some people, it's a religious ideology that if I blow myself up in the name of, of this conflict, I'm going to be a martyr and, and, and I'm going to have streets named after me and, and, and Gaza. And that's, where the West, it's really hard for people to, to understand that within this society, these terrorists are seen as freedom fighters. They've, they're seen as heroes of the resistance. But again, if your tactics are raping people, shooting people, burning them alive in their homes, we're, we're talking about like two completely different things here. On October 7th, when the terrorists came in, they weren't wearing a Palestinian army uniform. And for the Bibas children who are still in Hamas captivity, I ask you, what does a 10-month-old baby have anything to do with the conflict and, and what's going on? So it's not just Hamas that we're fighting, it's also the education system and the socioeconomic opportunities that come from having freedom and not being managed by a terrorist organization. Another thing I want to add, too, is everybody wants to talk about the UN and, and UNRWA, and there are pictures, there are videos, it is documented that in UNRWA schools, in UNRWA employees' homes, there are rockets, there are equipment for causing terror. There was a photo that came out with one of the hostages that there was an UNRWA badge um, in that same room. So I wanna call out the UN for the double standard that they treat everybody else in the world differently. But when it comes to Israel, because we're a Jewish country, it's different. I'm thankful that you broke that down. And even when you think about, um, we in America were able to see the release of the Palestinian prisoners and then those Hamas hostages as they got off those um, buses, you know, went in to get um, medical treatment out in Egypt. But the two were starkly different. I mean, the Palestinian prisoners having parades and, you know, throwing events in the middle of the city upon their release. And then the Hamas hostages, they're just trying to get into the hospital to make sure her. No bones are broken. Everything is okay. A very stark difference. Um, I know you mentioned um, previously that if people were to hear some of the stories of the captivity of the Hamas hostages, they would probably have nightmares. I know you know some of those stories, Raina. Could you share them with us, if you don't mind, if you're able to, just to put into yeah. perspective that this was not a, a vacation? Yeah. Uh, Mia Shem, she was shot at the music festival in southern Israel. Um, since coming out, it's been reported that a veterinarian performed surgery on her arm. There were two young boys who, when they were kidnapped, their terror, the, the Palestinian terrorists put their legs against the exhaust pipe of the motorcycle so that if the boys were to get away, they would be branded um, and they would know who they are. There was a, another man, I believe a Russian guy, a Russian uh, Israeli who was being held captive and he managed to break out, like managed to run away from his captors. 
only to be returned by other citizens in Gaza back to Hamas. At the beginning of this war, there were a lot of Jewish people who were sharing on social media this image that said, would you hide me? In reference to World War II and, and Jews being needing to be hidden by the government. And to be quite honest, when I first saw those images, I kind of thought maybe this is a little extreme. But when the situation happened of this man who escaped barbaric terrorists only to be let back, it made me realize in 2023, you know what? There are people who wouldn't hide me. And this is not something they ask to do. So putting things into perspective, some of those Palestinian prisoners doing things to please Hamas terrorists as a form of honor, whereas some of these, um, well, the Hamas hostages, they were just taken for who they were. So one thing was seen as a badge of honor for a terrorist organization, while the other was just, I'm taking you captive because of who you are and what you stand for. Exactly. Exactly. And I feel terrible for the Palestinian children. I feel terrible for the Palestinian adults who live in Gaza and have to live within this hateful construct where there's no normalization. So again, until a Jewish neighbor can be recognized and accepted, how can we really talk about future steps and and peace it's going back to the society even in children t tv shows they are inspired to want to cause terror you see children with weapons in fact yahya senwar who who spoke out the other day um he came out of hiding for those who are uh just now tuning in yahya senwar was um was a man who was arrested and was in Israeli prison and he was exchanged as a part of a thousand prisoners for one Israeli uh Gilad Shalid in 2017 he became the head of Hamas he's one of the main architects uh behind the October attack and most recently he came out of hiding to make a statement and he's holding what looks like a, a four-year-old or a five-year-old boy He's in head-to-toe uh, camouflage. His his face is covered with his, you know, with just his eyes showing. And you see Yahya handing him this gun and and trying to to hold him. And you can visibly see that the child is is uncomfortable as he continues to kiss and and raise him up, you know, as if it were Musafa in The Lion King. So for all these people who who are watching and for all these young people who are looking up at their leader and seeing that child and imagining, I want that to be me. You know, something else horrific that came out on October 7th, there was videos of a young boy in Gaza and you could see where other young Palestinian children, young children were hitting him and screaming him and poking him with sticks. So this isn't just a, a government issue. This isn't just a, a political issue, and this isn't just a, um, an issue of, of, of terrorism. This, what's going on, is a crime against humanity, and it is genocide. When the terrorists came in on October 7th and shot people in the head and burned them in their homes, now reports are coming from women who work in the morgues about some of the things that they saw. Women, women were raped so hard, they're bleeding from their private parts, some with their legs chopped off, some no tops, no bottoms, bleeding from all kinds of places. And this one woman, I'll never forget when she was talking about the horror and the contorted faces that these dead bodies were in, she said all of a sudden we were looking at the bodies, there was this little bit of color. And the little bit of color was that all these young women had perfect manicures. And as women, you 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 wear that as a, a sign to feel beautiful, as a sign for hope. And all these young women did as a crime was go to a party 
in Southern Israel. And something else about that music festival that happened yesterday, many of the survivors who survived that attack, they had a party, a, a, what they call a silent disco, where all the people had their own headphones on with music playing. And together they went back and they danced. So when this war first happened, one of the first things I thought was, are we ever gonna be able to dance again like that? And we're seeing now through the strength of the Israeli people, through the mentality of Am Yisrael Chai, though it was the deadliest day for Jews since the day of the Holocaust, we're, we're growing from these pains. And most importantly, anyone who is lost as a result, we are honoring them, we are memorializing them, we are saying their names, and they will never be forgotten because they too gave the biggest sacrifice, they gave their life in regards to this, this ongoing situation. Well, Raina, I want to thank you for your strength um, to tell those stories. That's not something that's easy to hear. So you verbalizing it, I know it wasn't um, easy for you either. Very difficult. But I appreciate your strength to share that. Um, really briefly, if you don't mind, before I let you go, I know anti-Semitism is a word that has been tossed around left and right um, in the midst of all of this. Um, if you can talk about the concern of that um, right here in America, we've seen things that happen during that Thanksgiving parade in New York. We've seen how um, artifacts, people put their hands in blood, putting it on um, historic artifacts in New York. Even people gluing their hands to the street, um, defacing um, Christmas and holiday items. Just talk about that concern um, for the Jewish community here in America. There's a difference between freedom of speech and freedom of reach. You can say whatever you want to say, but that doesn't mean people have the right or the legal obligation to hear you. I'm all for people organizing their own protests, but when your tactics endanger the lives of others, when your tactics threaten people, when your tactics disrupt events that have nothing to do with you, the the Macy's Day Parade, the Christmas lighting, the, the other night in New York where people were burning NYPD hats, then we have a problem. Through my experience, education and dialogue, we don't have to agree with each other in order to understand. We just have to be willing to have a conversation. And in most of these protests, instead of sitting down at the table to have a conversation, they find it's much easier to burn the table, kick the table. I was shocked yesterday in Atlanta, Georgia, of all places, there was a woman with a Palestinian flag who lit herself on fire outside of the Israeli consulate, which is a part of a, you know, a group of buildings where there's multiple businesses. Three people were injured. And what does that accomplish? I mean, certainly for people who don't know anything at all about the conflict, you setting yourself on fire is demonic. It is scary. And when I was on college campus, it was also ironic too, how many of these anti-Israel protesters, their messaging was also executed with hateful tactics and rhetoric. As a college student, I had a fake eviction notice put on my dorm. I was told, you know, they brought in speakers who said that the that the Holocaust never never happened. So when we talk about anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism is hatred against Jews. And it's been around for thousands of years. In every generation, there's been a major persecution of Jews. It's just people really only talk about the Holocaust as the last one. At one point, there were Jews who lived all over the Middle East, but they were kicked out of their countries and Israel was the only place they had to go. So when they chant from the river to the sea, 
where do you where do you expect the Jewish people to go? Because that's that's the whole the whole map of Israel. And what's important to know about anti-Semitism is when we don't speak out against the words of hate, the words can turn into violence. The way the cycle happens is usually it starts with words. Then the group gets singled out, right? They're, they're not the same as everybody. And once that group is put to the side, it's very easy to eliminate and target that group. And while Jewish people now might be that main target, everyone else in the world needs to wake up because if you believe in the basic freedoms of freedom of speech and men and women sharing the same rights and the freedom to be able to get on the news and to say whatever you want to say freely, then you're next. Because the ideology does not support a world where that exists. Raina, I appreciate your candidness and your strength, again, sharing these stories with us and your perspective. Is there anything else you'd like to add? I just want to echo that Israeli women matter. When we say me too, that should also include Jewish women. Finally, last night, the UN Women's Organization, they've come out, they've made a statement, but it's not enough. It's not enough. I want to hear the outcry from people that rape should never, ever, ever, ever be ignored, number one, which is what a lot of these organizations preach, is to listen to the woman. And number two, we need you to amplify what happened on October 7th, because there are people in the world today who are saying we made it up. So the United Nations, I can't say that I have forgive you for your lack of action um, in, the, in the last couple of weeks, and the same thing to the Red Cross, but now's your chance to make it right. Speak up, because your silence, we can hear you, and we're gonna remember it too. Well, there you have it. Raina Rose Exelbeer not holding back either, giving her remarks. Raina, as always, thank you so much for joining us here on Live Now from Fox. I know you and your family and loved ones are um, dealing with a lot right now, but I appreciate you taking the time out to join us and um, educate us this morning about stories we otherwise wouldn't hear in a headline. So thank you so much for doing so. Thank you for having me and thank you for the platform. I really appreciate it. Absolutely.